Hi, I'm Nicola White, mudlark and artist. I've just arrived here at Canary Wharf by boat on this beautiful day. And I'm just about to go to Royal Docks to meet with Simon Pirani. Why don't you come and join us? My name is Nicola White. I'm a mudlark and artist and I'm here today with Simon Pirani. Simon is an energy researcher, a historian and writer. He's the author of Burning Up, A Global History of Fossil Fuel Consumption. And today Simon has agreed to let me rack his brains about fossil fuels. We've all heard of fossil fuels, but I realise that I actually don't know anything very much about them. I mean, I find fossils on the Thames foreshore, like these beautiful micrastas, echinoids, they're millions and trillions of years old, but what are fossil fuels? I mean, are there fossils in fossil fuels? What are fossil fuels? Fossil fuels are called fossil fuels because they're formed in a way very similar to the way that fossils are formed. So. If we think back to a time 100, 150 million years ago, uh, large parts of the earth, including this part, were covered by swampy forests. And as the trees died and the plants uh, died, they sunk to the bottom of those swamps. And over tens, hundreds, thousands of years, uh, more plants and trees fell and the pressure on the matter at the bottom increased, but it's, it was organic matter, just like the living creatures that are preserved in uh, your fossils. That process is, is similar to the process that uh, makes fossils, and that's why coal, oil and gas are called fossil fuels. Thank you very much for that explanation, Simon. So what are the types of fossil fuels and what are they used for? So there are three uh, types of fossil fuels. The first is coal and coal has been burned to produce heat for thousands of years. Uh, we know that it was used in China thousands of years ago uh, for that purpose. Uh, Large-scale uh, burning of coal, uh, not just to produce heat but also to drive steam engines and uh, machinery, dates back to the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century and Britain uh, played a central part in that. Um, that coal is also uh, used today in uh, power stations in many, many parts of the world. Uh, the second fossil fuel is oil. Uh, large deposits of oil uh, were discovered in the late 19th century and also people worked out how to access that oil, how to drill for it, how to bring it to the surface and oil is used mainly for transportation of course. The crude oil has to be refined and from the refineries we get uh, whether it's diesel for trucks, um, petrol for cars, aviation fuel and other uh, materials. Uh, oil also is supplied to the petrochemicals industry um, which produces plastics and other materials. The third fossil fuel is gas. It's often, the, the deposits of gas are often nearby or in the same place as deposits of oil. Uh, gas has been used particularly over the last 50 or 60 years, mainly uh, as fuel in power stations. Gas is also important as a raw material to produce fertilizers for agriculture. So we've got coal, oil and gas. So how do fossil fuels produce energy? So strictly speaking, uh, a physicist would tell us that energy is not produced, it's not created or destroyed, it changes its form from one form to another and we can think of that energy being uh, kept inside those fossil fuels and released when the fuels are burned. So, to give a very simple example, if we light a coal fire in somebody's home, uh, the coal is burned, oxidized, and that produces heat, which heats the room in which the fire is uh, lit. Another simple example is a gas boiler. 
um, the gas in the boiler is uh, is combusted, is burned, that produces heat and that heats up the water in the boiler which in millions of homes in this country circulates around and is used uh, in the radiators for uh, heating the home or as hot water in the bathroom. The other way in which fossil fuels are, are commonly uh, used is to drive motors and uh, turbines of different kinds. So if we have a car, uh, petrol uh, is fed in small quantities into the combustion chamber. That drives the pistons, that drives the crankshaft, that drives the wheels of the car. So through that is that energy is converted into motive power to move the car along the road. Um, in a power station, uh, the gas or coal is burned to heat uh, water in a boiler, which, is, which becomes steam uh, under a great deal of pressure. That steam drives a turbine, and this is the clever bit, one of the great inventions of the last 100, 150 years, that turbine produces electricity. The existence of electricity networks, which are now ubiquitous and which we use for absolutely everything and which cover the vast majority of parts of the world where uh, human beings live, the existence of those electricity networks is actually going to help us to find a path away from using fossil fuels, which we'll need to do uh, because of global warming. And the reason for that is because electricity, which is currently almost entirely produced from fossil fuels, can be produced in other ways. It can be produced by dams on rivers, hydropower, that's already been happening for many decades. It can be produced from wind power. Uh, Denmark, for example, uh, has produced a great deal of its electricity uh, from wind power over the last century. And it can be produced and is being produced increasingly from solar panels. Uh, that's uh, a, a type of electricity production that's uh, rapidly expanding. And hopefully those renewable sources of uh, electricity will power our system uh, in the future uh, in a post-fossil fuel age. Right, well thank you so much for that concise explanation and having heard all that, I mean what are some of the benefits and what are some of the drawbacks of fossil fuels? So the benefits uh, became obvious during the Industrial Revolution. So if you have a tonne of coal it takes up half or less than half of the space that a tonne of wood would take up. People used to use wood a great deal uh, for burning and it's got twice, at least twice, the amount of energy concentrated in it. Um, another advantage uh, with coal was that it was much easier to move around from place to place. So at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in this country, the main industry was uh, production of textiles and the textile uh, mills were were sited mainly on rivers because they needed the water power to move the machinery. Once they had coal in sufficient quantities, they could move the mills into towns nearer to where there was labor uh, available, uh, workers available to work in those uh, textile mills, and that led to the expansion uh, of the textile industry. And of course that versatility, that ability to take that energy and uh, have it where you want it uh, is even greater in the case of oil. And uh, by the end of the 19th century and the early years of the 20th century we have the invention of uh, the car and uh, the use of oil in cars which again was one of the great stories of industry in the 20th century. The drawbacks are many and there's two we can divide them into two types. The first type of drawback is drawbacks that we've known about all along. And the drawbacks we've known about all along are air pollution. Coal is filthy and if you burn it, uh, it puts filth into the air. And of course in industrial cities 
uh, up until the 1950s in this country, but right until today, if uh, we take India, for example, which uh, uh, has an enormous amount of coal in the economy, it's filthy stuff and it kills people, air pollution. And we know that I think it's about uh, 10 million deaths a year are caused up until today by uh, air pollution from uh, fossil fuels. There are also problems about getting fossil fuels out of the ground. Coal mining is obviously a notoriously dangerous business and uh, getting oil out of the ground is not particularly safe either. And then there's a whole set of problems concerned with the, the control of the coal fields, the control of the oil fields and the control of the infrastructure through which uh, coal and oil is moved in the economy. And of course wars have been fought over uh, the control of oil fields uh, between uh, different countries. Now we've known about those things all along. The real problem which came up uh, and was properly understood by scientists I'd say in the last 50 years is the problem of uh, global warming and the way that uh, uh, burning fossil fuels contributes to global warming. And the science was the scientists knew there was a problem in the 1960s and 70s and by the early 1980s they pinned it down. They were very clear about the connection between burning fossil fuels and uh, global warming and in 1992 we had the Rio conference where the politicians from all the main countries in the world gathered and signed a treaty saying uh, global warming is a problem, we've got to deal with it and fossil fuels is part of that problem and since then they have failed to deal with it every year and every year uh, with the exception of one or two due to economic problems uh, the use of fossil fuels has grown and unfortunately it's grown even more quickly since 1992 than it was growing uh, before then and that's a real problem. Well, that's certainly given me a lot to think about. And going back to fossil fuels more specifically, how are they related to the greenhouse effect? So there's a range of human activities, that economic activities that contribute to the greenhouse effect. Um, let's take, for example, clearing uh, forests, whether for agriculture, whether for logging. If, if we clear forests, that means that they can no longer do the natural job that they've been doing of sucking uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So that has a bad effect because that means more carbon dioxide accumulates in the atmosphere. But fossil fuels is the main problem. Roughly three quarters of the uh, greenhouse effect that's caused by human economic activity, roughly three quarters comes from burning uh, fossil fuels. So we are talking about a major change that has to be made for the whole of society and I find often two reactions people have to this. Some people shrug their shoulders and say well you know I can't do anything it's up to somebody else um, which is a very natural thought. Um, other people read up a bit on, on climate change and think about it and become scared and actually that's also a natural reaction. I can understand that thought as well but I don't think it's right to think that there's nothing we can do. I mean first of all there's things that obviously things that individuals can do. Take a train instead of flying, take a bike and bike round to the shops or walk round instead of driving in a large SUV as some people do. Something we've all been doing this winter because of these uh, very uh, high uh, energy bills just turn down the heating a bit more systematically at home don't forget. So and obviously all those things help because uh, they decrease the amount of fossil fuels that are going through the system. But let's be honest, those individual actions are on a pretty small scale. Effective action has to be taken by governments. And I think the first thing I would say people have to do is ask why is it that governments since 1992, since they all agreed that something has to be done, as we often hear politicians saying on television, <laughs> something has to be done. But nothing really effective has been done and 40 years is a long time to wait. 
So if we have a look at some of the solutions, I like to think that I can make a difference. How can we reduce our fossil fuel consumption? There's a, what I think is a bit of a myth out there that uh, if we reduce fossil fuel consumption, uh, it's going to affect our quality of life. There are a lot of things that we can do which will actually improve our quality of life at the same time as reducing uh, fossil fuel uh, consumption. We see cities like Amsterdam which are built to encourage uh, people to use bikes and to walk and to use public transport and where particularly in the city centre I mean the number of cars is absolutely minimal. And then we've got a city like London which is kind of halfway between. We've got brilliant public transport, we've got the lovely Elizabeth line that's just been opened, it's absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much Simon. I have learnt a great deal today. Now if someone would like to read more of your work, because I know you have a blog and of course you've got your book which is Burning Up, The History of Fossil Fuel Global Consumption, um, what is the best place for people to find out about your work? The good news from uh, the publisher of my book Pluto, and I'm really grateful to them, is that they've now uh, put the book as a PDF in a free library and if people if you google it you'll 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 soon find it and it's it's not even a pirate version the, the publishers have done this because they want the book to be available not only here but uh, in countries in the global south where people are, are tangling with these pretty complex problems and uh, if people want to look at my uh, blog it's people nature or one word so people nature dot org Thank you very much and thank you everyone for watching and if you've got any comments don't hesitate them to put them in the comments below. I'm always delighted to hear from you and I'm interested to, to see what you think and so thank you for watching and thank you again Simon it's been brilliant to meet you. Well and thank you, thank you for your questions. Mm -hmm.